All right. So I'll be presenting on the uh, semi-classical laser theory that was devised, devised by Willis Lamb, more famous for the uh, Lamb splitting. And so it's noted right here in red, contributed to the early development of the laser. And so in 1954, the first functional maser microwave uh, amplification stimulated emission of radiation was constructed. Though at that time, there wasn't really a formal mathematical explanation behind how they really worked. Shortly after collecting his Nobel Prize for lamb splitting, he set to work on uh, deriving the basis of lasers. And some brief history of lasers. <laughs> Sorry. So it's light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. What does that exactly mean? It's not a Z, it's an S. So we have a set of atoms that are interacting with an electromagnetic field inside of some cavity, which I know we've already seen. The cavity is sized such that it supports a single set of eigenfrequencies. The excited state of the atoms are resonant with at least one of those eigenfrequencies. And so when they uh, try and release their energy to fall back to a relaxed ground state, the only way they can do that is by transferring that energy into the uh, like external electric field. So the emission part occurs when the excited state is sufficiently populated, i.e. we have a, a population inverted inversion and the uh, state two is more uh, heavily populated than state one, the ground state. And so just to sort of elaborate on that, what does that exactly mean? Are they like sort of like some sort of light bulb? And the answer is no, they actually work on an entirely different set of uh, math compared to like normal light bulbs or LEDs. So rather than just being a focused beam of light, there actually are, they are single wavelength, as I said, 550 nanometers right here on this little one I'm holding, uh, single wavelength beams of light that arise from the fact that only uh, certain frequencies can be sort of stably emitted out of our specifically sized category or cavity. So it's sort of, with gas lasers at least, the closest example would be sort of like a, I guess it'd be like those like resonant tubes that you know, like people play with in physics labs. You put a cap on one and it changes the frequency, uh, sized for gas atoms. They can only emit specific frequencies that are resonant with the uh, usually noble gas constants inside of them. So they're like a really fancy neon light. Oop, too far. So what was Lamb's model? So Lamb's model for a, raise, a laser, uh, taking the simplest and easiest to uh, calculate example, has a ring-based cavity with a linearly polarized electric field. So inside of that, when you have that set up, the only appreciable frequencies that you can get follow the equation Vm over m pi c over s is equal to kmc. s being the circumference of the ring cavity, km being the corresponding wave number, and m is just a nice integer on the order of 10 to the sixth, so a million, uh, to make it work nice. <laughs> because otherwise, and obviously c is like the speed of light constant. I was writing notes to myself on my copy. So we have our two equations here that I'm not going to uh, go before because I didn't have access to that. But there are our equations for frequency and velocity. So now if we plug our population uh, data uh, equation into that, we can get these two bottom equations. Yes. What more do you want to? Uh, just to, uh, what you explain what all the calligraphic signal mm -hmm. uh, ah. symbols are. Uh, I would... Yes, like beautiful or what does it like? Yeah. 
This one, right? Like yeah. there's like a looks like a calligraphic P, a calligraphic P or a G, another calligraphic P. Well, yeah, there's a Greek capital. Yeah, there's a calligraphic L, a calligraphic sigma, a calligraphic rho it's or P. Sigma. What they need? Uh, we didn't ask you to call the letters. We ask you what do they need? Uh, uh, so the calligraphic P is the polarization. The yeah. and the B and epsilon. I think it's supposed to be an L, a calligraphic L. Oh, okay, it's, <laughs> it's a C. Yeah, I, I read the entire notes on this thinking it was an L. Yeah, higher. Oh, yeah. So that it's the loss. Oh, that was. See, now I was wondering why I couldn't figure out where they were putting loss into this and thinking that was a C, but if it's an L, then of course it's loss. Who's writing it? Dimitri? Dimitri is writing. <laughs> <laughs> I showed you talking and writing small Let's not uh, on the fly ask uh, Adam, just based on this equation. Does it look familiar? Who needs them cavity? Like yes, the, there will be some more familiar ones coming up. <laughs> yeah, so the L is our uh, energy loss to the uh, cavity walls, since we have a gas inside of a, a real gas inside of a container. It has collisions. And this, uh, I thought it was a sigma. It is a sigma, right? Oh, no, it's, it's called graphic E. For uh, for EU yeah. electric, electric field strength. Yes. Uh, yes, it's the strength of our electric field. And then, of course, uh, if you really want to go in depth, you can um, continue on to calculate losses that are caused by imperfections in the mirrors of your cavity. But that's the much. Fossil, what's the, the other? Little p or little rho? I don't know what is it. Like in the next set of equations. Uh, like wait, big calligraphic P. Right, yeah, right, this right. one. This one. Yeah, and then the next row in the equation. What are they? So this, these rows are your population. And uh, indexes stays for state A, state B, or what is it? Yes. The. But then why? Why is there two indexes? You can just population of a state. Why is it two indexes? Why is it A, A, B, B? What does it mean? It's a two-state system, isn't it? But you cannot perform it also. Can why, you? why it is row A A instead of row A? Why one uses two indices? Looks like it's a matrix element rather than just the value, right? Rather than just population is just a number, right? If the speech defect instead of row A, row A. <laughs> you know. uh. It's for sure population. Yes. And it, it's only just a speech defect. Uh, what I'm thinking it is, is that, as I said, it is for sure population, but it's the like total resting ground population and the total excited population, right? Because the laser doesn't exist as a laser beam until we have a population inversion where the number of excited states is greater than the number of ground states. Yep. But so T stays for the ground state, A stays for the excited state indexes. Yes, yes, okay. And then uh, this uh, calligraphic little rho or little p squared. Yes. I... In front of the electric field strengths. Transition. Dipole. Thank you, Dimitri. But did he say that the big lattice was uh, polarization, right? Yes. And little one is a transition dipole or backward. No, okay. that's fine. Ah, okay, good. Okay. You need an, uh, a magnetic field for a uh, laser to work as well. 
It's a great number of components. So the only things which is left at the very last formula, the last two formulas, gamma and omega. Well, I, I guess omega and nu. What's the difference between omega and nu? I guess both. I was thinking yeah. it should be frequency. <laughs> I was understanding omega as frequency as well, but where are you? I frequency don't... of the transition, A, B transition, right? Yes. And then nu? Nu. Curvy. Nu. Omega minus nu? At the very bottom. Yeah, like omega minus nu. Oh, this? Yeah. Of V, I don't know. You it's like a new but yeah. <laughs> Oh, I, What's the meaning of this one? I was reading it as we, uh, that should be uh, the, but Dimitri, you already kind of give you the hint. Yeah. Velocity. Oh. <laughs> they're both frequencies. At least I'm assuming that they're both frequencies. Well, technically, again, what is a laser? You kind of give it as idea. So you should have a crystal. Well, if you talk about solid laser, there is a crystal and crystal has some impurities, right? Mm -hmm. So impurities are very important and because impurities will contribute to this higher energy uh, state, I guess, which is called A here, because they have long living states where you can create this reverse population. I mean, kind of a, a lot of population comparing to the, but but you cannot, when you kind of, in this material, right, you, you, you also have host states. So I guess, Blue one, new with blue level, corresponds to the energy of the host material, of the host crystal. Like, right? Like, U is the frequency of the, the resonator. Yeah. Because remember, uh, uh, Stephen was introducing the C numbers. Mm -hmm. So it's like when U is for resonator and omega is for, for the active medium. Ah, okay. Okay, then what's lambda? Or not lambda. Gamma, gamma. <laughs> The last one, gamma. Don't want to take it off your brain. I think Adam, you explained what gamma was, but I can't remember what you said it was. Escape. Because Escape. 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 I know me and Tori were both trying to find out what gamma is and it's let's ask Adam. Are you sure it's the same gamma here? But what was your gamma? Yeah, that gamma was the dissipation frame. It was a dissipation mm -hmm. constant. Well, damping, right? Yeah. Should we have damping here? Uh, uh, since both theories were borrowed from the same textbook. Yeah, there is a chance that Mosser was continuously using weather gamma for that. <laughs> yeah. So it's damping. And yeah, sorry. Is it has damping Oh? Huh? No, omega frequency gamma damping. Yeah, you can see it on damping. For example, about that, you in Stephen was mentioning something like not perfect uh, uh, mirrors, right? Or any kind of imperfection mm -hmm. will result on the damping. Yeah, as I sort of just like casually explained, if we are thinking about our laser chamber that we're talking about in this example as a physical object. <laughs> Doesn't want to come off. We essentially, we have a ring that, as I said, it's essentially, it's a neon light ring of a very specific size. And the way that it actually forms the laser beam rather than just glowing quite prettily is that by having it of a specific size, it's only capable of really sustaining frequencies around it of a very specific type, like one or two singular like frequencies. So the light is traveling around the ring? It's mirrored. <laughs> or is it like you've got like an inner mirror and an outer mirror and it's just like circular shaped? I wouldn't throw the circle shape on the ring resonator. Sometimes people assume 
uh, like four years and it, it travels in, in rectangular rather than uh, okay so the idea is to make the light move around yes yeah okay it's it's like a particle collider but we're not working with particles we're working with beams of light does that sort of make sense because mm -hmm. this whole thing is inside an electromagnetic field okay sorry just to clarify so what you're saying is that despite the fact that you set the way resonance you still have to like um account for the fact that it's a yeah it's a real object and so it has imperfect uh states and it's losing energy along the way so dimitri actually made a, a change to one of the later slides to account for that uh i don't know if we're done with this slide oh i should have put that so we now have just moving on we have this equation for our population and the various components of it. We plug that into our previous two equations, where in this case, what well, I was going to mention, V, this capital V here, is the volume of our cavity. And now you ask Stephen, we have all of these script letters again that you haven't introduced. <laughs> what are those? Uh, they're this. The script A and script B. Uh, script A is the, oh yeah, it's, I put it on there because I knew I would want, is the linear gain parameter and script B is the saturation parameter. Yes. Are those related to the Einstein coefficients? Remind me about the Einstein coefficients. They, so like the A and B coefficients describe the, uh, like the rate of, I think, absorption and stimulated emission? Respectively, or no, B is both both types of emission. I think it's that way around. A is, a is B, and which which you're looking at is either absorption or stimulated emission. Yeah. So then, what would be the application for Steve? It's healthier not to make a parallel because the meaning is uh, inverse and not non linear. So what is used as A is stimulated absorption. Yeah. And B is something very different. So, well, say, therefore, they use uh, quadratic to, to be different. Just remember, we're pumping energy into this constantly to right. uh, add it. It's like I said, it's like a neon light. It doesn't just glow by itself, it needs energy it's, added. Quadratic uh, A is like an Einstein coefficient B. And this little gamma is somewhat related to Einstein coefficient A, which is like is not for the comment of synergies, but it's better not to make these parallels. Okay. What is and not in uh, the calligraphic A equation? And not this one yeah. is the same one as our population. Okay. So it's and not over uh the shield population. And, and now the, there is a question where is lambda A and lambda B? Uh, also gamma A and gamma B. Yes. Before we just have gamma. <laughs> so gamma is damping and lambda is pumping. Because in addition to these two levels, there are many other levels that are uh excited by regular like flash lamp and so there is a pumping rate for our active levels just because one energy level is stable doesn't mean that others don't exist uh, so is and not like how many more excited atoms you have than relaxed Essentially, I think in a way, yes. Us as showing you us as showing how much of them were lost, right? Population in steady state solution for population inversion. Okay. Yes. But but, but is it true? And not is the initial population? No, steady state. Steady state. Yes. Move some surrounding. 
And so now simplifying those, so we, so we now have these two equations, which we can now plug in all of that into as well. And then skipping over the simplification because it's just a lot of crossing out terms. But uh, the uh, holographic E, the electric field amplitude squared is proportional to the number of quantum. Then one can uh, convert the equations into in terms of number of quantum in the mode of the of the field. That's the But what exactly is the goal? Through these equations, what is our main goal to get at the end? What are the characteristics of lasers? The end goal is that by with these final two equations, we can now actually determine the behavior of the laser, in that we can determine the. Uh, yeah, we should be through these. We should be able to be able to determine the threshold energy, which is the minimum energy we need to sort of reach inside of our uh, cavity chamber for it to actually laze. Looks like you don't have energy in this equation. Number of quantum in the mode. Oh, and little n is number of quantum? Yes, multiplied by our omega will be energy. Okay. I knew I should have kept that equation. I cut it because it didn't feel like it fit. But yes, it is possible to determine sort of the exact number of photons we have in our laser beam uh, through what we have here. And it's actually quite a simple equation. And then we need kind of the high energy is a better what? The high energy is generated in the initial moment of time. I mean, because it also depends on time. I'm just trying to understand how this characterizes a laser. In other words, characterize means good laser versus bad laser. <laughs> what is better? Big M, big number, like when it's a big number of photons can be, for photon, photon modes can, no, photons, number of photons, right, are generated in the resonator, is it? In a short period of time, of course, right? Yes, I believe that should give you a brighter and more powerful laser. Since you'll be able to translate, but we contribute, and maybe Max will uh, share his own vision on this uh, answer on this question. We, we will re ask this question when you present it. You can start your presentation with this answer. Uh, so, one can measure amount of energy pumped into the laser system, and one can measure energy going out of the laser system. And then one can make a ratio, energy out divided by energy in. If this ratio will be linear if it is a regular photodiode, but if suddenly it changes its curvature and, and provides much bigger gain, um, changing this curvature of gain versus uh, input, it is a criterion of laser generation. And Stephen is making his effort to. Uh, explain how one can get this abrupt raise of the energy coming out. So, so far in your previous slide, the, the graph which you were showing in the previous slide based on this solution of equation, previous slide. Yeah, so it's given us only out quotas, right? Yes. Without including how much it was inserted, how much energy or how much photons it was inserted to the Laser material. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this, this, I believe, would be comparing uh, sort of A is, it's the same graph, but now we have our A minus our C. And I mentioned a very specific term called the laser threshold, which uh, you'll be able to see referenced on the slide below this. The laser threshold is a critical term because it's actually, as I said, the amount of energy that you need to reach before your laser will begin to laser. Before that, it's just a box filled with light. Once you reach the laser threshold, which is, uh, as Dimitri wrote it, well, A is equal to C. Formally, if you had a perfect 
sort of laser system with no inefficiencies, perfect mirrors, no losses anywhere, it'd be A is equal to script B. C is taking into account uh, losses due to an imperfect system. And so we can see the higher our uh, A minus C, the more number of quanta we're getting out and a better laser beam. And then Dimitri mentioned a critical phrase, nonlinear. So the reason why this is this threshold is considered so important is not only, as I said, it determines uh, when it becomes a laser, it's because we can define it by putting energy in until we reach the point where our uh, A is equal to our uh, losses and out, uh, emission. And then after that, the amount of photons in our laser grows quite rapidly. So we have a nonlinear production, hence the threshold condition. It's the lowest amount of excitation at which the emission by the laser is dominated by stimulated emission from the field uh, and relaxations rather than spontaneous emissions, just a light bulb. Uh, and now what I was asked to include to help lead into Max's talk. Uh, the laser threshold as a second order phase transition. So in this case, with our perfect uh, system, A is equal to B. And this is also why I uh, prompted about uh, P representation. So in a condition where we are far... Yeah, I kind of had more... Our expectation value for our energy, we can uh, represent with this equation right here. In cases where it's uh, far below the threshold value. Is it energy or altitude? I'm not sure. I'm just asking. It might have been expectation value of the energy of the electric field. Okay. Which Please go ahead. But uh, the key takeaway is what we have here at the bottom is that our expectation value, if we have uh, sigma minus sigma t is below zero, it's below the threshold, our expectation value of our emission is zero. If it's above the threshold, then it's uh, A over B times this geometric series. Is a function uh, with discontinuity. Yes. Okay. And this is this was for the way. Yes, C defines the threshold, right? The coefficient C. C, C defines C our. C defines the uh, the loss of energy. C, C, C is a loss. A is pumping. No, before it was B. There's two. Several yeah. slides ago. Uh, the calligraphic A and calligraphic B. Yes. So, uh, which slide do we want? This one. Yes. Yeah. The calligraphic B is our loss. That's a loss, right? Yes. For yeah. an ideal system. Yeah. But then you kind of introduce the case C equals A. It's some kind of regime which allows you exactly the threshold when nothing is growing. Uh, threshold means it's reaching its plateau, right? Yes. It is. So when it, when A is equal to C, that is when uh, stimulated emission is now the dominant factor and it's outpacing spontaneous emission. It is now an actual laser. Well, exactly at this, they're not, they're kind of equivalent to each other, but. Yes, you need to cross this point for it to become a laser. Before right. that, it's just taking in light or taking in. It's a property of your, uh, your instrument and A is something you can, you can take to turn the node. So, no, I shouldn't in, it's backward, but it's in this part. You can control losses. It's property of the But A is not losses. A is energy in. Oh. Oh. Which so, you can control. Yes. Yeah. And B is our losses for an ideal system. 
they call it saturation. Well, it, it doesn't matter how we call, we understand what is it. But, yes. A is what we're putting in, B is what we're getting out. We need to have what we're putting in be at least equal to what we are getting out. Say equals B means you're in the... Your energy is equal to the amount of energy that's coming out, which is the threshold you have to cross for it. To in this that. case, you will have no any light, right? Yes, that's why it's the point you have to cross. Ah, okay, good. So we are in this range when nothing is coming out. Yes. As long as A is larger than B, then you have nothing coming out. It's not a laser. Once B becomes larger than A, then you have a laser. It's defined that the point when it becomes a laser is when B is equal to A. What we have here with this red C is accounting for uh, non-ideal system losses as well. B only accounts for ideal mathematical losses of our energy. C accounts for the losses to our instrument. Okay, so in other words, this can be really measured. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can estimate it from measurements. I have no idea. Oh. It'd be likely this A plus B is needed only to uh, solve for this nonlinear equation, right? But, but again, it's an average E. You said it's not energy? I would bet for electric field. Strengths. Yes. And then uh, square then then the uh, electric field square will be energy and it will be linear as uh, offset between one and two. Mm -hmm. As soon as you reach in your threshold and get in high than threshold, then the electric field will be what you said proportional to what? The elect it's proportional. Ah, and again, this little gamma. <laughs> this little sigma here is sigma. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, so our a, our energy in is uh, alpha times sigma. Yeah, yes, they are proportional to your calligraphic energy, but, but, yes, but yes. then sigma, sigma means sigma is the population inversion. Inversion population. Yeah. But they Thanks. have sigma and sigma t. Sigma t is uh, the changes we need to our population inversion to get our losses. Yes, our right. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. So just kind of a different way to really a way to write it. We formulate so this uh, a b kind of letters through connecting them to the something which you can measure because your yes. average electric field probably can be measured mm -hmm. through absorbables. Yes. Yeah. It's after it's an electromagnetic field, which is the next point that I was asking. Lasers as magnets. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I say, Stephen, what are you talking about? A laser is not a magnet. A magnet is a magnetic field and a laser is a beam of light. Well, this question. <laughs> I suppose you are. <laughs> but, Hypothetically, we all are. Yeah. Oh, oh, you just assuming this was a question. Well, obviously, as you all laughed when I said lasers as magnets. But so the typical treatment of laser behavior is a self-consistent field where we have some expectation value of our field strength. And from that, we're deriving the strength of our beam of light and as a second order phase transition. Well, and to that you say, now, hold on, that sounds very similar to how we would describe the behavior of a magnet with a second order transition of a consistent field of some electromagnetic strength. With our uh, expectation value of our magnetic field being N, uh, it's mu or no, that's mu. Yeah. Yes, mu. Uh, mu tan h, mu h over the Boltzmann constant times t. And now for a three dimensional case, this actually has not been solved yet. But it can be approximated by taking that h and replacing it with h plus uh, lambda m, which is just an approximated constant to account for the interacting field strength. And we get this equation which should look familiar or will very shortly. And we also get this very familiar looking equation down here, where we now have A over B, Tc for the critical temperature or the Curie temperature minus T over T one half. And our expectation value below that, so is zero and above that is that. Should you define what is your Tc once again? I mean, not just name it, but define it. 
DC is the carry temperature. It is the critical point that uh, above which a permanent magnet loses its magnetism. It's really quite spectacular if you watch a demo of it. It spins just becomes... Spins now have the energy, enough. yes. They now have the energy that they are no longer locked into a magnetic field. They can now spin freely again. And so we lose our magnetics. Completely beyond the things you're talking about, but I'm just curious, I, I, I really don't remember. People say critical temperature and Curie temperature. Is it the same or not the same? They are the same. Ah, okay, just different way how you call them. Critical temperature, you specific. Critical temperature, general Oh, just for the phase transition kind. Yes. So then could you hypothetically make a laser just with magnets? With magnets. <laughs> you have a strong enough. <laughs> so the only problem, I think, again, here is a trick, same as was a question of uh, of um, uh, Patricia to, to Adam, right? Uh, what's the difference between uh, vibrational damping versus electronic damping? So mathematical formulas are the same, but physical meaning, I mean, like the observables, of course, are different, right? Different energies, uh, different kind of properties. Pretty much the same here. So mathematical formula is the same, but in, there is no light coming out of the magnet, right? But there is orientation, a kind of coherency in the spin behavior. And you need a magnet to make a laser. <laughs> well, there is a difference. Uh, there are similarities and differences. If one puts uh, this figure, then uh, it can be non-zero at uh, low temperatures. Okay. Would you please flip back? And here, if you notice these conditions, if one has this uh, signal parameter, signal threshold, it goes when signal goes grows bigger. So yeah, the reverse behavior. Right, it, it has non-zero behavior inside of the, the pressure problem. But in both cases, it is this continuous function with uh, infinite uh, derivative, which is a signature of, of a phase transition. The uh, and that actually is the end. Okay, let's see.